Good morning, Waterway Free Methodist Church. So excited to worship with you this morning. Um, I was just listening to the song, I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my shame. I'm waiting down for the joy of the Lord. This morning, uh, I'm youth pastor and Brad Robart. Uh, we talked about trading down our fear and picking up our faith. So what are you trading this week to know Jesus more? Let's worship. God, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for all of, our, all of us here this morning to just lay down our lives for you, Lord, and to listen to what you're speaking to us this morning, God. We praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
sun that's up in the sky, but our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, shines on us, and we just love to feel the warmth of his embrace and all that he gives for us. Amen. The feeling that we get, especially when we are a child of our kids, a child of God. Offerings. There's a uh, box on the back wall by the mailbox uh, for tithes and offerings. Also, you can do it online through your banking financial institution or on the church website as well. Uh, Sunday school, Sunday morning, uh, there's a class going on in the sanctuary, and the lighthouse is a class uh, going on. We're doing walking through the book of Luke. Uh, youth are upstairs. Bradley's been talking about that as well. Kids are downstairs in the lower level on Sunday morning, 9.30. Great time to be a part. Home group tonight. Home group tonight. We're doing Luke chapter 4 and 5. Luke 4 and 5. That's your homework for the afternoon. Read it. Read through Luke chapter 4 and 5. And we're doing tacos, if I remember right. Tacos. Uh, we get the meat already and the shells. Just bring something for done tacos or something to go with it. That'd be awesome. 6 o'clock tonight at our house. If you need directions to see me, I can get you that. When, uh, Tuesday night pickleball, 6 o'clock here in the multi purpose building. Uh, a lot of fun activity going on. I think uh, Kevin and Mark have been having a showdown. Is there a Mark running? Wins. Mark what? Mark wins. Mark wins. <laughs> Mark wins. <laughs> Come Tuesday night, have a great time. Hey, uh, I forgot to load the trailer for this. I remembered about halfway through the third song. 
but uh, we are starting a new Bible study on Wednesday night. It's called Jesus' Farewell Message. It is his message to his disciples as he heads towards the cross. In the upper room, <clears throat> it's his instructions. He pours out his heart to his disciples. Uh, Easter's right around the corner. I mean, just six weeks away. And so this is a six-week study, and it's the message that Jesus gives to his disciples. Uh, Francis Chan is the, the speaker on the video. It is powerful. You will not want to miss it. Wednesday night, 6.30 in the lighthouse. Uh, there's youth group going on as well upstairs, and then kids club in the lower level on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, 6.30, a uh, great time to come together and uh, learn about the things that Christ has for us. Uh, as he sends his message to his disciples and to us uh, Wednesday night. Uh, family rock painting, February the 25th. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the back wall if you would sign up for that uh, from 1 to 3 o'clock as well. Um, and I think that's all the announcements. Uh, oh, Somerset Beach. If, you're, if your kids are interested in going to summer camp, a uh, great opportunity. There's uh, more information on the bulletin board or you can go online look at Somerset Beach. It's Christian camping, uh, uh, camps for kids uh, all ages on up, the high school kids. Uh, and if some of you would like to donate to sponsor a kid to go, uh, we'll be talking about that as well. So if you'd like to help a kid get off and go to camp, uh, help their parents with some of the costs, that'd be a great thing to do. Let's do our memory verse together. Trust, Trust in the Lord with all my heart, and we not only our sin, in all of our ways acknowledge him,
closeness. I want to draw near God right now. I'm trying to slow myself down right now. Just to focus on God.
together for prayer. of shootings, loss of loved ones, cancer, car accidents, earthquakes and tragedies all around us. And we need you in our lives and more than ever Father, in each one of those situations, devastation, tragedies, we can call upon you to come alongside, carry us, hold us in your arms, comfort us, because we can't do it on our own. We, we can't explain it. It doesn't make sense. Devastation happens and life change. We need you more than ever before, Father. Father, I pray that you'd be with each one of those situations. Father, we pray for Kelly as she starts another round of chemo on Monday. Strengthen her body as only you can do. You are the great physician. It is you and you alone. Father, we call on you. Oh, Father, do something amazing. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Father, I pray that today your sweet Holy Spirit would come and meet with us just like it's doing down in Wilmore, Kentucky at Asbury, that your Holy Spirit would be in our hearts and lives today. And you would do the work that only you can do. And we would respond to you today. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The kids can be dismissed for junior church. Disciple of Jesus is a learner. Learning to love like Jesus, walk like Jesus, live like Jesus, be like Jesus to others. That's what we're called to do and to be like Jesus. That's what we're called to do. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Samuel. We are walking through the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, chapter 1, as you know, is Hannah. She prays. She's being a, a bully belittled by her uh, the other wife, so to speak, um, the challenging wife. They already had children, and she's praying for a son, and she commits it. If I have a son, I'm going to give him, dedicate him to the Lord, and she finally has a son. His name's Samuel. She takes him to the temple, gives him to the priest Eli, and uh, praises God for her son that God gave to her. And then in chapter 2, we learn that uh, Eli, the priest, has two sons, they are scoundrels, they are troublemakers, they get into all kinds of trouble, they cause all kinds of trouble, they have no respect for the things of the Lord, 
and we learn that sin unchecked just gets worse. It doesn't go away, it just gets worse. And we can watch that and see that. And then we raise the question, do we have some undisciplined areas of our own lives that we need to look at and evaluate for ourselves as well? And then uh, Samuel chapter 3, uh, the Lord speaks to Samuel, uh, calls up to him to the night, and Samuel doesn't know who he is. He runs to the priest, Eli, and no, it's not the priest, it's God calling him. Eli finally says, hey, when, next time the Lord calls your name, speak, your servant is listening, are the words that he was to say, speak, your servant is listening. We learn that God speaks to us in many ways, and he still speaks today, whether it's through the word of God, or the voice of God, or nature itself, or through other people, or through the Holy Spirit. God speaks to us. And the question we raise, are we listening? Do we make time and space to listen to God? Do we take the time to stand back and just listen to God, to hear his voice, and respond to what he has for us? 1 Samuel chapter 4, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. At this time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelites' army were camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Apak. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. What a way to start a chapter. What a way to start the chapter. The Philistines are the bad guys. Okay, they're the wicked. They have all kinds of gods. They are uh, troublemakers. They're always at war. They, they 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 they've been at war with Israel for a long time. The Israelites are the good guys. Uh, the Philistines, the bad guys, and four thousand men were killed that day. And the Israelites retreated to their camp and asked the question in verse three: Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Why did God let the Philistines beat us? It's the same question we ask, it, not it? Why did this happen to me? Why did God allow this to happen to me? When things go wrong in our lives, don't we say, why did God allow this? Why did God allow my, my loved one to get sick? Or why did it let this accident happen? Or why did uh, uh, this thing happen in my life? And why did you allow my spouse to go and do? And we ask the question, God, why did you allow this to happen? Is the PowerPoint not working? Because I want to point out something. Go ahead. There we go. So that's right. That's right. Uh, so they ask the question, why did God allow this? It's a fair question. Why does God allow sickness? Why does God allow trouble? Why does God allow bad things to happen? Why? Why do things happen like that? I think if we can blame God for what just happened, or blame someone else for what just happened, if somehow if we can blame someone else or blame God, we feel better about it. Right? There's some satisfaction about it. It happened yesterday at my house. As clear as a bell, I'm only going to use this as a sermon illustration, but my wife's in here, so it's okay, because she can testify that this is true. She fell against my truck and broke my bug deflector, wind deflector, on my new truck. <laughs> I know it was her. I have images of her stumbling, losing her balance, hurting her hand on the corner of my truck, and I know that's how it got broken. And I feel better because she did it. And she gets in the truck and tells me she didn't do it. So it must have been one of my other kids. We feel better if I can blame someone else. <clears throat> for what happened. I don't know why we do that. The Philistines attacked, and the Israelites were like, God, you allowed this to happen. God, it's your fault. It's your fault. And somehow, we feel better, and like the Israelites, if we can blame something. 
And there's nothing wrong with asking that question. Who did it? Or why did God allow it? Why did God let this happen to me? Why did God allow this disease or this sickness or this death or this tragedy or this shooting? Why, why, why? It's okay to ask that. But I think we need to take the next step and ask the other question too. God, what are you teaching me? God, what do you have for me? God, this is painful and hard and suffering, but God, what else is there? What are you doing here, God? What, how do you want me to join with this tragedy in my life? How, how are you going to help me understand? Are some of those other questions I think that we need to ask along the way. How can I team up with God in the midst of this accident, this tragedy of my life? Instead, the Israelites came up with this great ideal. And here's what you need to understand about this ideal is that man's ideal is never as good as God's ideal. Let me just say that. Man's ideal, a way of fixing things, is never as good as what God has in store or God has planned around the corner. Verse 3 goes on. Then they said, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Silo. Uh, we'll carry it into battle with us. It will save us. It will save us from our enemies. It will save us from our enemies. Underline that in your Bible. You'll need to know that. The Ark of the Covenant was holy. No question about it. The Ark of the Covenant contained, if you look in Hebrews chapter 9, and there's other places in Numbers as well, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was this golden chest made of special wood, and inside the Ark there was a bowl of, of uh, manna that they saved from their 40 years in the wilderness, reminding them that God provided for 40 years food, manna. There were some Ten Commandments in there that God etched himself on stone tablets. They were in there. There was a staff from uh, Joshua as well. They were in there. The Ark of the Covenant was holy. So holy. Matter of fact, when God gave them the instructions on how to build it, he laid out every detail of it. The cherubims on top of it, how their wings were to be spread out, how it was to be moved, everything about it. It was so holy, it was placed inside the tabernacle, the tent, until the temple was built later on in Jerusalem. It was so holy that the, the priest would only go in once a year for the sacrifice for the atonement of the whole children of Israel. It was so holy, and it was designed and set up because there was some, a covenant that was made between man and God. God said, you obey me, follow my laws, and I'll keep my commandments or keep my commitment to you, and it'll all be good, but we know how people are. They don't keep up their end of it. This Ark of the Covenant was a holy temple uh, place. It was to be placed in such a, a holy place. Matter of fact, the instructions back in Numbers that the Ark was so holy that no one was to touch it. No one was even to touch the Ark. It was that holy. Matter of fact, they had rings on the side. That's where the poles are through there. And you, only the priests were allowed to carry it to even get that close to it. Matter of fact, we'll learn later on, probably this summer, when we get into 2 Samuel, where a guy reaches out to steady the ark. It, it's on a cart. Instead of being carried, it's on a cart. The stumble, uh, the oxen stumble, and he thinks the, the ark's going to fall. So this guy reaches out to steady it so it doesn't fall, and he dies. That's how holy this was. The ark of the covenant was holy. But the Israelites thought, well, hey, we will bring the ark, and surely it will help us defeat the enemies. <laughs> That's how holy this was. Let's keep going. Uh, 1 Samuel 4, 4. So they sent the men from Silo to, the ark, to get the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the heavenly army, they enthroned between the cherubims, uh, the two brothers uh, uh, of Eli, the priest, the two brothers are there, and they go with them to get the ark. And they are the scoundrels. They are, have no respect for God, but they are the ones going to get the Ark of the Covenant. That should have been the first warning sign. Like, if these guys are involved in this scheme, get away, step back, look out, watch out. Don't have anything to do with it. Maybe they were thinking about, oh yeah, remember Joshua? They took the Ark of the Covenant and they marched around the city of Jericho. 
And they marched around the city of Jericho and the walls fell down. Hey, we'll do the same thing. We'll, we'll, we'll repeat what God did back then, right? But the city of Jericho was God's plan, not man's plan. The city of Jericho was God's design, God's plan. It wasn't man's plan. Verse 5. When Israel saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, they shouted with loud, and they made the ground shake. So here they come, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and all the people see this Ark up, and they're shouting with joy. Oh my goodness, it's all awesome. This, the Ark of the Covenant's here. Da, da. They're so excited. The ground shakes. Everybody's excited. Wow, wow, wow. Instead of falling down and realizing that this is holy, they shouted. They celebrated. It was like a ticker tape parade for a winning Super Bowl team. It was a display. Their trust was in the ark. They thought surely the ark, just having the ark here, would do it. What are we really trusting? What do we really put our trust in? Things? Stuff? They trusted that when the ark showed up, they'd win the battle. It's all looked good. When I was in Mexico at a, on a mission trip, uh, we watched, uh, there was a temple that we went to one day, and we watched people lined up to go inside the temple, and we stood back at a distance, we could look through the gate, and they would come, and there was a slab, and there was a statue laying on the slab, and uh, I don't remember the religion, do you, honey? Uh, they, they would the, the belief was if you walked in and you could raise up the statue that was laying on the slab and as you held the statue you prayed and if you could hold the statue up as you prayed uh, your prayer would be answered they trusted in that that's what their faith was that's what they trusted that was it when I was growing up When you got married, I don't know if we ever got we got a big Bible. Anybody get a big Bible for their wedding anniversary? All the older ones are shaking their heads. And we took our big Bible and we laid it on the coffee table. Those are those tables in your living room for those younger generation. And it sat there and we dusted it every week. There was kids I grew up with in different religions, and they had statues in their yard and in their house. And they had crosses. They had crosses. I know a lot of people wear a cross around their neck. Yeah. What do you trust in? Do you trust in things? Or is your real trust in God? Come on. There, there's nothing wrong with having a Bible and carrying a cross. Nothing wrong. Don't get me wrong. But is that where your trust stops? And that stuff. See, the Israelites, they put their trust in the ark. It wasn't in God. It was, in, it was in, in, in this object. Yes, it was holy. Just like the Bible's holy. Just like the cross is holy. Those are holy objects. I get that. But their trust was in that. It wasn't in God. What do you put your trust in? Do you trust in the things that represent God more than anything else? I'm glad you came today. Don't get me wrong. But did you come to hear Perry do and Randy and Dwayne and Kim and Guy do incredible worship? Is that why you came today? Or did you come because you knew your friends were going to be there and hey, had, had to had show up, you know? Somebody might miss me. Or did you come to see how many times Pastor Brian misspells or mispronounced words? You got a list going, how many times? Specifically. I'll just help you with the county. <laughs> or you're watching online so you can check the box. I was at church today. Or 
did you come hungry? Did, did you come hungry for the word of God? Did you come wanting to see God move and do something in your heart and life? How many of you heard about the revival going on at Asbury Seminary? It started with the normal chapel and God showed up. Because people started to repent. People started to stand up and say, I, I messed up, I did this, or I need to forgive so-and-so, and this. And all of a sudden, it just the Holy Spirit shows up. It wasn't for a show, it wasn't for anything else. I listened to an interview with Glenn Beck yesterday talking about the Asbury revival. God just shows up because the kids, the people were praying to, to see God, to have him show up. Are you hungry for God himself? just the stuff. We okay? That's quiet in here. Well, let's keep going. I'm not done. First Samuel 4, verse 6. What's going on? So the Ark of Covenant shows up and all the people shout and jump joy and the, and the ground shakes and all that stuff and so verse 6 is the next follow up with that what's going on the Philistines ask what are they all shouting about the Hebrew in the Hebrew camp and they were told because the ark of the Lord arrived they panicked the gods have come to their camp little g very important little g the gods have come to their camp they cried this is a disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. How? Who can save us from these mighty gods, little g of Israel? They're the same little g gods that destroyed the Egyptians with the plagues of Israel in the wilderness. Verse 9. Fight as never before, Philistines. This is their rally cry. Their coach yelling, cheering them on. If we don't. We'll be slaves to Hebrew like they've been our slaves. Stand up and fight like men. So the Philistines fought desperately. And Israel was defeated again. And slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. And the ark of God was captured. And Eli's two sons died on the same day. Which was prophesied earlier on in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Died that day, both on the same. So the Philistines fought desperately, and the Israelites were defeated. God, why did you allow the Israelites to be defeated? God, why did you allow 30,000 men to die? God, why did you allow the tragedy to come to the camp? Why? Are we trusting in things or are we trusting in God? Do you wear your lucky socks? When you're having a basketball game, Tyson, you wear your lucky socks? No? Do you wear that lucky tie when you have that big interview or that meeting at work or you or you're, have your favorite coffee cup, so to speak? Do you trust in things or you trust in God? As the writer of Samuel goes on, 1 Samuel, a messenger runs back to the camp. Gets all the way back to the city. Eli sitting beside the gate. Uh, he is old at this time. And he hears the news that the Ark of the Covenant has been taken. <clears throat> the messenger goes on. Eli was 98 years old and blind at this time and very heavy. And he hears the news, what happened in the battlefield, that the Philistines had defeated Israel. The Ark of the Covenant has been taken. His two sons has died. And the priest Eli falls off his stool, breaks his neck, and dies. What do you trust in? What do you trust in? The tragedy goes on. Keep reading. 1 Samuel 4, verse 18. The messenger tells about uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Eli dies. 
verse 19, Eli's daughter-in-law, who's pregnant, she hears the news about the Ark of the Covenant. She hears the news about her father-in-law being dead. She hears the news about her husband being dead. She goes into labor. She has a son, and she dies at childbirth. And she names the child Ichabod, which means, where is the glory? <coughs> the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of the Lord has been captured and taken away. What do you put your trust in? What do you base your faith on? Are they the things of God or God himself? I love church, don't get me wrong. I love you guys. But I have better have one day with him than a thousand elsewhere. I need him more than ever before. Because the stuff around me is tragic. Because I have to trust in something. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. It's all about Him. Amen. Trusting Him and Him alone. He is the Lord of our hearts and our lives, and we have to trust in Him above everything else. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know the difficulties of your life that you're going through right now. I don't know what's on your plate, but I want to ask the question, are you trusting in the system? Are you trusting in yourself? Are you trusting in someone else? Or are you trusting in the Lord alone with what you're facing? Do you trust in him? Let's bow our heads. <laughs> examine your heart, examine your life. What are you trusting? Father, forgive us for all the times we trust in ourselves. Father, forgive us for all the times we think we got it figured out. Father, forgive us for trusting in other things and other people when we really need to just trust in you and allow you to do what you do best is love your children, care for your children, Carry your children when they hurt. Help us to trust in you and you alone. Whatever situation that you're facing this morning, would you be willing to stand up and just shout out, I trust in God? Whatever it is, we don't need to know the situation. We don't know, need to know what's going on. But if you're willing to make that declaration and just say, I trust in God, just stand to your feet and say, I trust in God. Are you willing to do that today? Just stand and say, I trust in God. I trust in God. No matter what the situation is, can you trust in him? Can you bring your faith in him? Can you trust him for the outcome? I trust in you and you alone. Father, we trust in you. It's not going to be easy. We're going to ask questions. Why did you allow and, and all those things? But Father, we trust in you. You got the outcome. You got it figured out. You looked far beyond our years. You looked far beyond us. And we don't understand why tragedy happens of all kinds. But Father, we trust in you and you alone. We don't put our trust in anything else but you, Father. So we stand today united together, trusting in the Lord our God. We trust in you with all our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in this song. <laughs> Lord, I come.
need you every day, every moment, every breath we take, we need you. Amen. We realize that and we trust in you today because you love us so very much. We trust in you alone. Father, I pray that this week we would see, we would experience your love, your grace, your mercy as it runs deep into our hearts and lives. And we trust you, even when we don't see the next step. We trust in you and you alone. Help us, Father. In the powerful name of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go and serve the Lord. Amen. Harry, finish it. Oh, I know.